Hey guys, welcome to Wednesday Night Light. We're so glad that you have tuned in and are joining us to once again open up God's Word and just be able to maybe glean some things from it today to be able to learn about where we are in this season of life and to be able to apply some things maybe not only to this season but also for the future. And so I've been able to have conversations with uh, many of you, whether through uh, a phone call, through a text, uh, FaceTime, Instagram. And one of the things that I keep hearing from many of you uh, is, is one of two things, either, hey, this is great and I feel like I'm in summer, uh, or uh, this is miserable, I just want to see my friends. I, I want to see my people, I want to be around my people, like I would go to school every day uh, if I could just be around my people. And uh, as we learn how to adjust to this new season, and, and one of the things that I want to look at tonight uh, may be a tool to help you uh, push through and be able to, to navigate a difficult season of life, to, to be able to put up with maybe that aggravating brother or that aggravating sister or that uh, annoying way that your parents talk to you, and, and just to be able to understand maybe a bigger perspective uh, and then be able to apply that not only to this season, but also for future seasons in your life. So we just came out of uh, a season called Easter. We celebrated Easter this past Sunday, and, and that celebration is about the resurrection of Jesus, that we know that Jesus uh, died on the cross, uh, was put to death, and was buried. Uh, three days later, was, was rose uh, so that we could have eternal life with God the Father. And so there's this, this plan that came that Jesus' blood was the, the ultimate, the perfect sacrifice for all humanity for all mankind. And so we celebrate that on Easter Sunday. And one of the things that I wanted to look at tonight was what happens next. Like Jesus came back. He, he, he rose from the grave. He did what he said he was going to do. Uh, but what happened next? And what happened next ended up starting one of the greatest revolutions that the world has ever seen in introducing this idea of what we now call Christianity. I want to look at the book of Acts. So if you have your Bible, go grab it. Um, turn to the book of Acts. Uh, right after all of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, begins the story of what happens next, what happens after Jesus. Uh, and so we look at some of these pages and begin to see uh, some amazing things. So let's look first at Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 4. <clears throat> It says this, this is Jesus, um, these are the last words that he has with the disciples before he ascends into heaven. It says this, verse 4, and while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he had said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, Will you at this time restore the kingdom <clears throat> of Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Verse 8, this is important. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And, and I think that this is so important because Acts 1.8 helps us understand how it is that we're going to get through the things that we're going to get through, right? Like Jesus uh, had been betrayed, arrested, uh, crucified, beaten, uh, put to death, and then he rose again. So the disciples are like, hey, when are you going to restore? Like, hey, lead us uh, so that we can continue to follow after you. When are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel and Jesus says, hey, you're not going to know the answer to that, but what you are going to get, what you are going to receive is the power to be able to live, to walk this earth, to do the same things that I did while I was here on this earth. And that power is so important. Acts 1.8 is one of my favorite verses in all of scripture. Uh, it says, you will receive power. And this word, the Greek word there is the, the Greek word dunamon. Um, and years ago, I, I heard a teaching that has stuck with me ever since uh, I was probably 19 years old, and uh, John Randalls, uh, who is the father of our good friend at Waterfront Church, Zach Randalls, um, he taught on this, and it was so important to me. It was so life transformational to me. It's actually uh, the reason that I have the tattoo that I have on my leg, talking about this power, talking about this might, talking about this strength that we would receive through the Holy Spirit. And so this word, Dunaman, 
uh, it comes from, or we get our English word from the Greek word dunamin, uh, dynamite. And so it's that type of power, that type of explosiveness, that type of might to shape and change things uh, is the same word that Jesus used when he described the coming of the Holy Spirit. And this is important because Jesus said you will receive that type of power, the type of power and might to get through any situation, to come against any foe, to any opposition that comes against you. You don't need Jesus standing there by your side to fight your battle. Instead, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, now lives in you, and now you have power through the Holy Spirit to face any challenge, any obstacle that life might throw at you. And so if you go on in, in Acts, uh, Acts chapter 2 is when the Holy Spirit comes, that day of Pentecost, and uh, when, when the Holy Spirit comes on them, they, they, they're moved and they're filled with the Holy Spirit, and it says that, Jesus, or that, that Peter preaches at Pentecost, and in, on that day that, Jesus, that Peter preached, uh, 3,000 people came to know Jesus and believe in him and receive the Holy Spirit themselves. And so it's this, this mighty move that happens. And at the end of Acts chapter 2 is where we get this first picture of what the early church looked like. Acts 2, 42 through 47 gives us what they were doing. What did the early church do on a day-to-day -day basis when they gathered together, they prayed, they broke bread, they uh, did ministry. All these different things happened. And so we see this picture play out. And then Acts chapter 3, we see them get back to work. And Peter and John are, are traveling at one point, and they, they heal a man, uh, and then they, they begin to just walk through the city and live their life uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit, doing mighty things and preaching the name of Jesus. And so then we get to Acts chapter 4. And this is where we're going to, to, to focus for a little bit, because Acts chapter 4, um, Peter and John get arrested because uh, the Sadducees don't like what they're doing uh, they, don't, they don't agree with the, the things that they see them doing there in the, the square and, and all these different things. And so uh, Acts chapter 4, verse 1, starts with this. And as they were speaking, this is Peter and John, to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. So put yourself in this picture. Get, get this idea in your head that Peter and John get arrested because they're preaching Jesus. And so they say, hey, it's kind of late in the day, so we're not going to put you on trial yet. We're just going to put you in custody uh, in the prison cell, and we'll come back and we'll deal with you in the morning. So as they take them away, there's this huge crowd of people, 5,000 people who have heard the word of God, believe that Jesus was the resurrection, and now they're, they're standing in this place, and they begin to go like, hey, what are you doing? Like, those people didn't do anything wrong. Those guys were preaching the truth of who Jesus was. Uh, and it's just amazing to see that, like, Peter and John had just healed this man, and he had been lame, and he was walking, and he, he had been a beggar at the temple gate for, for years, and now he's amongst this group of people, this 5,000, who believe in who Jesus is, and they've seen the power uh, that the Holy Spirit brought to these two men. And so it's amazing. But then we get uh, to verse 5. This is the next day, and they're going to begin to put them on trial. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, and John and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired. So they asked them this question, by what power or what name did you do this? Now, they're mainly talking about the guy who they had healed, uh, the beggar who they had healed that was uh, by the temple gate. And they're asking, hey, by what power did you do this? Is this uh, from, from some type of demonic uh, power that you're receiving this from some false god? And they said, by what power? And I love the fact that they use that word. I love the fact that they're asking them, by what power? When we had just heard in Acts 1.8, the words of Jesus said, but you will receive power. Same word, this dunamis, this dunamai, this dunamin. Uh, they, by that power uh, of the Holy Spirit, you will do great and mighty things. So when they get put on trial, the, the high priestly family, this uh, court, that this council that's been brought against them, ask them, by what power and by what name have you done these things? 
Well, Peter and John know what power they do it by. They know the power of the Holy Spirit that lives in them. And so look what Peter says, his response to them when they ask him this question. By what power, by what name did you do this? Verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, remember this is not his power, these are not his words, this is the Holy Spirit moving through him in a mighty way. With the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known. So he's going to tell them, hey, I'll tell you. Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that, the reject, that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. Like the, the, the whole founding piece, the, the piece that needs everything, uh, everything else is founded and can hold up by this one piece. This Jesus is the cornerstone uh, that you rejected. He's become the cornerstone and there is salvation in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now verse 13 is so good and this is where it relates to us in so many ways. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Now, this is so important because when Peter begins to give the explanation, he says, hey, it's not because of anything we did. We didn't, you know, stir up the potions just right. We didn't do all these things uh, to, from, a, from an earthly standpoint. It's the power that Jesus Christ gave us, the same power that he used while he walked this earth and performed miracle after miracle. That same power now lives in us, and it's by that power that this man was healed. And the, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees look at uh, Peter and John, and they say, they recognized them as, as uneducated, common men, that they didn't have this formal training. They, weren't, uh, they, they hadn't gone uh, through all of the years that, that some of these uh, high priests had gone through in the, the spiritual preparation to be a priest. Uh, they hadn't done all of those things. They had basic common education, yet their basic common education had seen flow through them the power of the Holy Spirit to heal this man. And he said, because they saw they were uneducated, they recognized they'd been with Jesus. That be, the same words that Jesus was using, the same power that Jesus was using, is what now these two men were using to heal the sick, uh, to cast out demons, uh, to love the poor, uh, to feed people. Like the, the same things that Jesus was doing, now these two men were doing. And so they get kind of scared, and, and they're not exactly sure what to do, and so they, they, they start threatening them. They said, hey, uh, you can't say anything. Um, we're we're going to let you go, but we want you to stop preaching uh, the name of Jesus. We want you to stop preaching who Jesus was. And look at verse 19 after they're, they're threatening them and saying, hey, don't go, don't say anything. Verse 19, but Peter and John answered to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. So, hey, however you want to punish us, punish us. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Some other translations say we can't help but talk about. We can't help but speak about the things that we've seen and heard. We've seen things. We've seen Jesus do things. We've seen Jesus heal people. And now that same power lives in us for us to be able to go and heal and speak words of life and encouragement into others. And so we can't help. Like you're, you're not going to get us to be quiet because of what we've seen. We've seen something too great, too wonderful. We've felt something too great, too wonderful. We've been a part of something too great and too wonderful for us to stop talking about it. So do what you will. Arrest us, kill us, put us in prison, whatever that may be. Do what you will. But we're going to continue to talk about the things that we've seen and we've heard. And so they end up having to let Peter and John go. They, 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 they can't hold on to them. They, they don't have a justifiable reason uh, to put them in prison. Uh, so they, they threaten them. Uh, they threaten them a further punishment. Uh, but they end up letting them go, and all of the people begin to praise God for what he is doing in the life of the early church. And so our, our lesson that we want to take out of this today, this, 
this teaching that we want to understand of how do we get through the difficult things that we're going through. And the encouragement today is this, that you can get through anything that, the life, that life throws at you, anything that the world brings against you. There is no pandemic. There is no uh, illness. There is no sickness. There is no frustration uh, that is more powerful than the power of the Holy Spirit in you. And so when we think about what power we live our life by, our perspective begins to change when we sit there and go, you know, I can get through this. Not by my strength, not by my power, not by me being good enough or strong enough or capable enough, but because I know what lives inside me. I know what dwells inside me. And that's the Holy Spirit, the promise that Jesus gave in his last few moments with the disciples before he ascended to the Father, was you're going to receive power through the Holy Spirit, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the very ends of the earth. And so now we get to live in that same might and that same power. So here's what I want you to do. Uh, your, your challenge, your homework for this week is I want you to take a selfie, take a picture, have somebody else take a picture, have the people in your, your family gather together for a picture, and I want you to flex. I want you to flex and take a picture, and then I want you to either send it to me or Abby, or Michael in a text, or I want you to post it uh, on your Instagram story, I want you to put it on Twitter, I want you to post it to Facebook, and I want you to put this quote on the picture that I am powerful, not because of my own strength, but because of the power of the Holy Spirit who dwells in me. I am powerful, not because of my own strength, but because of the power of the Holy Spirit who dwells in me. And I want you to declare that in the midst of any trial, any heartache, any difficulty, that you're not trying to get through that on your own power, through your own strength, by your own might. But instead, you say, I am powerful because I know who dwells inside of me. I know the Holy Spirit who lives inside of me. And it's that power, that strength, that might that can get me through anything. You are powerful. And my encouragement to you is to go live that way this week, next week, and the days to come. You guys have a great week. Love you.